Welcome back to the side view, everyone. My guest today is Jonathan Rousen. Jonathan is a Scottish chess player and philosopher, and he's part of a small group of people who have been awarded the title of Chess Grand Master. This is a topic that Jonathan has written extensively about in books and articles. He's very much uh, in tune with the side view's idea that uh, attention is some kind of an art form, perception is some kind of a skill. These are uh, things that lie on the other side of practice, development, attunement, all kinds of good things like that. We didn't talk today about his experiences with chess because I wanted to ask him about something different. I wanted to ask him about an organization that he runs. It's called Perspectiva. Perspectiva is a website, an online publisher. Um, they have a social network attached to it called Emerge that we talked about. But the purpose of this conversation was to talk about their new publishing initiative. So Perspectiva has recently published five new books. This isn't their first time uh, moving into the publishing space, but it's definitely a larger push for them in terms of getting new titles out there. So if you're interested in the kinds of things that we talk about here on the side view in terms of uh, collective coordination, collective action, uh, various issues with sense making and technology and uh, practices of development, practices of change and transformation, then you're going to want to check out Perspectiva. I'm going to leave a link in the show notes to the new books, as well as links to a few of Jonathan's essays. I don't want to give away too much here in the intro because Jonathan does such a great job of describing the books, describing the initiatives um, that he's hoping to um, address with Perspectiva. He's not just, uh, like I said, a accomplished chess player, uh, but he's also a person that has experience in academic and scholarly contexts. He has experience in uh, public policy making in nonprofits and charities. So he knows a little something about organizing. Uh, he knows a little something about uh, fundraising and putting work out there that's that's of high quality and of relevance to the present moment. So be sure to check out those notes. Be sure to check out the new books that they've just published. And without further ado, I'll just go ahead and go straight into the conversation with Jonathan. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Side View Podcast. I'm happy to introduce my guest today. His name is Jonathan Rousen. Welcome, Jonathan. Hello. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for coming on the show. The Pleasure. occasion for this episode, we've Jonathan and I have exchanged a number of messages over the past few months um, talking about uh, Perspectiva and the various books that he's written and um, you know, various topics in philosophy, but the occasion of the conversation today is that uh, Perspectiva has just published a series of books, five new books they've just published. And so I thought now would be a timely moment to sit down with Jonathan and talk about Perspectiva and to talk about what they're doing. So why don't we start there? Can you just tell us a little bit about what is Perspectiva and what was kind of your idea behind its founding? Okay, thank you. So, as you know, this sort of question I would have been asked many times, and uh, um, I have developed elevator pitches along the way. But quite recently, I was speaking to Gan Daniel Gortz, whom you may know or have had on the show, and he said, you know, people expect an elevator pitch, but really they have to take the stairs. Mm. Uh, so I'll do somewhere in between. <laughs> so Perspectiva came about through a meeting of me and Thomas Bjorkman, who's a uh, well, he's many things. He's an ex-financier, a successful businessman for many years. Then he became a kind of social entrepreneur and created lots of organizations. He's also a theorist in his own right and has written several books. And he is a member of the Club of Rome. And he'd been around policymakers and political leaders and business leaders for many years. And he'd noticed that um, there was a limit to how far they were willing to go in their inquiry about how to change society. So they would often speak in terms of systems thinking, and they would sometimes speak in terms of cultural change. But if you ask them about the meaning and purpose of life, they would just run a mile. They would like, hang on, that's beyond what we can do as societal thinkers. 
Um, and Thomas thought this is a bit troubling, that there were resources there at the heart of what it is to be human that are absolutely essential to any meaningful grappling with collective action problems at scale. And around the same time, I was working in the RSA in London. The RSA abbreviates to the Royal Society of Arts, but actually it's better to think of it as a kind of policy institute uh, with a big public events program and a kind of membership. And I was working on climate change principally, so I'd given a great deal of thought to just how acute our ecological challenges were, but I'd also raised funds to study um, sort of public attitudes to spirituality. Uh, and partic the particular angle on that was a, a richer theory of human nature that was arising from very, I say arising, being rediscovered um, in a range of sources from behavioral economics, social psychology, neuroscience, anthropology, and so forth. And the view was one of human beings as more deeply socialized, uh, more deeply automatic, uh, more embodied, uh, sort of meaning seeking, narrative loving creatures rather than kind of rational calculating deliberators. And all of my work was informed by that. So the work on spirituality and the work on climate change. Um, and so Thomas saw this and realized, oh, hang on, we're actually doing similar work. Um, and we got talking around that time, I was quite keen to move on to something bigger that I had more control of. Um, and so the idea for Perspectiva was formed and quite quickly we latched onto a, a simple way to describe it. And, and the, for those philosophers, there were some sources in this in a little bit of Wilbur, a little bit of Habermas, a little bit of Karl Popper's sort of famous lecture on the three worlds. But we ended up with the catchphrase, systems, souls and society. Mm. And this was our attempt to encapsulate the need, what we felt was the pressing need, the urgent need in some ways, um, to connect what we understand about complex systems at scale, the inner life of human beings, and all that that means, um, psyche, soul, spirit, um, even if you're an atheist, what these terms mean will vary, but there's a certain, a commitment to the depth of the human psyche. And then a challenge of how do we discuss these things what are the right symbols for these things what are the right icons and, and uh, images to encapsulate these kind of relationships but it was a so it was a commitment to understanding and practice and method that was concerned with global collective action problems but was grounded in the depths of human experience and we felt we had something to say there and that others may want to contribute to that was worth building an organization around and so that was back in 2016 or so. Um, so fast forwarding a little bit, in that time, my first challenge, Thomas provided some seed funding, but it was very clear I had a clock ticking to mobilize support because we're a nonprofit, because um, we're trying to work for the public good. And um, I managed to raise funds to keep enough to keep going and then a bit more to give us a chance to hire some people um, and begin some projects. So we've We've begun a few things. Some of them are a bit sort of tentative and just feeling our way in. Some are deeper commitments. Um, but the work we've done so far includes work on uh, sort of deeper understanding of activism, trying to understand activism psychologically and in terms of the limitations of activism, why it hasn't succeeded on its own terms and what that's about. We've done some work on what we call the, uh, the digital ego, trying to understand the online sphere less from the perspective of the mind and more from the, the lens of the ego as some a sort of uh, self-organizing uh, self-concept that uh, has a sort of psychodynamic quality but also evolves and changes over time and what, what's happening to the ego online not just what's happening to the mind or the emotions. Um, and we've done various other things. The, the, the Emerge website, whatisemerging.com, mm is now part of Perspectiva, although we keep a little bit of branding kind of difference because they're, they're reaching a somewhat different audience, a somewhat, they're somewhat broader and aiming to be a bit more accessible. Perspectiva is a little bit more quasi-academic, um, but even within that, we think to do good work today, you have to bring the whole self. So that means the playfulness, that means the body, that means not expecting too much of text. Uh, although valuing, of course, great writing as well. Um, so that gives a kind of overview. There's probably big things in there I've missed, but um, what, one, of the, one of the main things we're doing at the moment is something called the anti-debate, which is a, a concept I first came across by a, a, an article Peter Lindbergh wrote mm. for Emerge. 
Um, but it was a it was a very tentative skeleton idea, and we've we've managed to raise funding at Perspectiva, and I'm working with Mark Vernon on this, who's a philosopher you might know, yep. to try and um, develop a practice worthy of our times, so that a form of conversation that brings the best of debate in terms of the desire to seek the truth, the desire, the sort of spectacle quality of that, the mattering of that, but also brings in some of the spirit of dialogue of sort of shared empathy and concern and compassion and might have some kind of dynamic quality so that it's something that people can pick up at scale without having expert knowledge necessarily mm -hmm. um, and without necessarily knowing um, you know, it's not, not not an elite discourse. It's not stages on the stage talking to the crowd. It's something more that people might learn to do themselves as a practice. So that brings me to the books. So that's, um, you know, a kind of like broad canvas of Perspectiva. Um, why the books, right? That's kind of what you were asking, I think. Yeah, yeah. well, we so, can get to that. Maybe yeah. let me ask you just one or two more questions about, about the sure. organization. When you say, um, you know, you're, you're highlighting these different issues that that you're working on or that you're studying what is that what does that work look like are you doing sort of anthropological field research are you doing are you collecting data is it right. philosophical in nature like what kind of what kind of resources do you put into those questions so at the moment um we're mostly um it's mostly philosophical in nature but philosophy broadly conceived Mm -hmm. um, so I'll come back to the actual nature of the outputs, but the, the sort of thematic strands are what we call insight, which is, you know, goes without saying a certain quality of trying to see into the heart of things. And that's where most of our intellectual leadership work comes, including the books and a, an essay series that we've done and later perhaps a podcast as well. Um, then there is something we call, um, praxis, which is where the anti-debate sits. We also have this. Mm -hmm. In, incipient and nascent but potentially very powerful metaphor inquiry trying to help organizations find the right metaphors for what they're trying to do uh, and then that's a kind of embodied relational practice that we're working on um, and there's also we have an improviser on our team Pippa Evans who's written a book about how to improvise better and some people think like Benita Roy that there's a deep philosophical basis for that today that somehow improvising is what we have to learn to do better mm. um, so those are all kind of practice based and then there's the research base in addition to that we have something called realization and originally and there's a lot of bumps along the road when you create a new organization we had planned we we're very influenced by you know zachary steins an associate for example and very influenced by theories of building thomas bjorkman had written about the nordic secret and the the role of transformative civic education in that we were going to create something like a transformative education alliance trying to be the curator and convener of all of the different people around the world working on transformative education. And we had a particular idea of how to define that and shape it. It sort of ran out of steam somewhere along the way with COVID and funding and people, mm -hmm. but it's still there in, in principle. And the way it's manifested, although this wasn't expected, is through an encounter we had with uh, an enlightened aristocrat, I would call him, in the UK called the, third, the current Earl of Shaftesbury. Mm. Um, and he is a guy similar age in his early 40s who had through various events in his own life suddenly found himself with this massive country house uh, in Dorset which is about two hours outside of London and um, he wants to give it a public purpose you know he he, he does uh, weddings to pay the pay the cost of the, organ the building and so forth but he wants to give this beautiful place uh, some value and he's also part of a line of people, including some of the previous Earl of Shas Charles of Shaftesbury, who are quite famous for their either their uh, societal contribution in terms of helping to improve social conditions and social reform, or also in philosophy. The third Earl of Shaftesbury was a sort of contemporary of John Locke, and arguably every bit as good a philosopher, but just got kind of forgotten through the way history unfolded. Had a bigger influence in Germany and and. Uh, Anyway, I mentioned that because building was the pattern that connected us there. The third mm. Earl was one of the main early theorists of building. And when we realized that, it was a sort of deep connection. And so we've created this realization festival that was due to happen last year, got canceled because of COVID or postponed, it was due to happen this year. And it's going ahead beginning tomorrow, um, but only with 30 people, because of course we had number limitations on 
for safety reasons. Anyway, that's realization. And right. then finally, right. there's emergence, which is um, basically the website. What is emerge? What is emerging is the website. Um, but there's also this kind of network called Emerge, and we, we've created a a new mighty network platform that's about to go live quite soon. The point of Emerge really is kind of perspective a social arm, but it's really about recognizing that people are not always finding each other and trying to get better at helping with that. So because it's sort of light touch on substance, it doesn't have a very, the perspective it kind of has its view of the world. Emerge is a bit less committed substantively, but it is interested in the idea of what it means to be a we today. You know, what, mm -hmm. We keep invoking the we that has to solve the world's problems, but we don't reflect much on what that really means. Um, and so they're trying to sort of tie together networks and there's some underlying network theory. They're also trying to be a new media channel so that uh, they can compete with the powers that be who are blasting in mis misinformation. Mm -hmm. um, that's a bit like in the spirit of the Consilience project, but it's it's somewhat different. Uh, anyway, sorry, that's a lot, but um, the answer to your question is a combination of sort of applied philosophy, um, mostly manifest in written documents, um, but with quite a lot of embodied relational practice, quite a lot of network building, and quite a lot of public event hosting. Mm -hmm. So let's then talk a little bit about the books that you've just published uh, just in the past week or two, I think they've yeah. just yeah. recently come out. Um, it sounds like the publishing venture, you mentioned, you know, doing some online writing and things like that, but it sounds like the publishing venture is kind of a new arm of the project. Um, yeah. And you're, you know, like the side view, you've decided that publishing in print is, is still important. This is something I feel very strongly about. If you ask, uh, yep, there it is. If you ask, uh, if you ask any writer, um, what their thoughts on it, they uh, surely nearly all of them will say they would love to appear in print. Appearing online is, is nice. And of course that's important because that's where most of the, most of the eyeballs go onto the screens, right? You know, so the, you know, at least for us, the, the number of online readers is always going to be literally orders of magnitude bigger yeah. than the print readers. And yet here we are printing books. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about, well, one, just, you know, the step into, you know, kind of publishing more long form manuscripts and then, you know, why, why, why are these artifacts important at all in the digital age? Sure. Well, I love the question and I know that you have an investment in it too. Um, well, I love books. Um, that, that, that's a lot of people say that. I suppose I love their materiality. I love the, the sense of it being a cultural artifact at a particular point in historical time, that it has that weight and depth and definition and texture, that it exists not only for the eyes, but also for the hands, um, that the pages can be heard, that they can be turned, that they can be felt, and that those feelings um, sometimes outlast the ideas that are in them. We often remember books by their size or color or um, a typeface on the front. Um, so there's something about just doing it for the love of it uh, as part of it, but that's not all that's going on. Um, there's a deeper commitment, I think, to how I see, you know, we call Perspectiva an urgent 100 year project, and it's partly mm -hmm. a joke. But the, the urgent side of that is look, we have a certain amount of time to contend with particularly um, well, climate change in particular, but ecological challenges more generally. Um, and so there is an urgency to sort of clarify how we should act at scale. But there's also this longer term 100 year project idea. Now, superficially, you might think, look, if you want to be ecologically friendly, don't don't cut down trees to print books, right? That seems like a no brainer. But I think a deeper perspective is that books represent a few different things that are of value. One is they represent um, duration of time slowing mm -hmm. down and giving yourself almost a tool to slow down so this is a you know it's a book but it's also a way of saying stop uh find a place um mobilize your attention and let it sit there for a period of extended time that matters it's precious the book is 
you know, some people have dogs so that they exercise because they take the dog for a walk, right? I mean, they might have it for other reasons, but you do hear people saying, now my dog's died, I'm not quite sure how I'll get out and exercise. And it's not quite like that, but there's a, some, there's a sense in which the function of the book is not just the material inside the book, it's also the enabling device to allow the system to take the time it needs to process emotionally and mentally what's happening not only in the book, but therefore what's happening within oneself and in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so that's partly why the materiality of the book matters. The other thing is for the authors, right? This is the other side of it. Um, as you say, people quite happy to be published online, but love to be published in print. Um, part of what we're doing is we're conscious that a lot of people working with Perspectiva are doing a work that's broadly aligned with our own and they're going to public talks and before COVID again, but um, in some ways COVID it's, it's also has its own value because it's a, again, a material form in a, in a slow form in this hyper digitalized uh, culture. But, but assuming that people are still going to talks in real life, the book that they carry with them is a, a kind of, um, it gives them a certain amount of latitude and a certain amount of attention with which they can make their case. It gives them that authority, that entry point, that mm, plausibility that what they're about to say is grounded. And frankly, and you may, you may feel the same way, Adam, but much of what we write, we write to be read, but increasingly I feel, especially with conversations like this, a lot of writing is about giving, you something, giving yourself something to say um, in conversation. You know, a lot of writing is so that the quality of your speech and thought improves so that you can connect with people more deeply. Um, because without doing that investment and in finding one sentence after the other, and as you know, that's often an arduous task, that's what gives you the conviction and the felt sense and the excitement to convey a worldview to someone else, to convey your sense of what matters to someone else. So it's partly for the love of the book. It's partly for what the book allows people to do. And it's partly for what it gives the authors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really resonate with all of that. I think also the the interesting thing about books is that they 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 point us in a different direction. It's a different set of affordances, you know, if you think about it that way, than the the affordances that are available on the internet, which have been um, pointing in the direction of increasing connection, interconnectivity, relationality ephemerality, uh, sociality, all of these kinds of um, things that the internet makes possible. And my view is that we've, we've, seen, the, we've seen those in, in many cases as sort of unalloyed goods, more connection is better. You know, that was, that's kind of been the, the through line of the internet, that it's going to connect us all. And um, it has. And now I think we're kind of at a stage where we're really realizing that all of that connection isn't um, unabashedly good. It comes with downsides. And one of the downsides is, you know, something that you've thought about as well is that it has this quality of assaulting our concentration, our attention, our ability to focus our, and so there's something interesting about a print book to me in that it's not connected to anything mm -hmm. else. You know, mm -hmm. obviously you still have to show up and focus and pay attention to it that's on you, but the book doesn't go automatically anywhere outside of itself the way the internet does. And of yep. course, you can chase down those references, you can understand those illusions. Books are always talking about you know, other people in other books, and so they're connected in that sense. Yep. But from the standpoint of the material from the medium, you're, you're, um, I love this phrase that I've, I've been trying to use more, adaptively disconnected. So there's a there's a kind of a there's a kind of a sense to it where if you're reading that text that's theoretically all you have in front of yeah. you if you're smart enough to leave your smartphone in the other room at least you're, yeah i think it's a great way of putting it the the one of the main qualities of the book is the absence of hypertext the, the absence of hyperlinks it makes me think somewhat you know humorously but not without some um validity maybe that you know there used to be coke before there was diet coke or coke light 
um, and that's without sugar and people will buy it for the lack of sugar. But in some ways, a book is like, buy this, no hypertext, you know, right. it's in some, there's some kind of similarity there in terms of, um, you know, the, the book is a place where you're not going to be taken to another website. Right. Um, right. And, and I think in that there's a little wisdom because people might say, well, just don't click on the, you know, the links, but you're like, well, are you really strong enough? You know, sure. The, sure. the algorithms know you better than you know yourself. They'll come and get you, you know. Mm -hmm. so. The other thing I, I like about uh, uh, the book is that obviously you can print multiple editions. You can print revisions. It's a much harder task than to, say, um, edit your own blog post after the fact. You know, there's, there's, there's a kind of a safety in feeling like, oh, I can publish this and then tomorrow I can revise it. Or then the next day I can just publish, yeah. you know, version 2.0. And so you, and there's something, there's something kind of beautiful about that too, where you can iterate in public. You can have conversations about the piece as it's developing. There's something nice and, you know, improvisational about that. The book though, there's more pressure there because the revision probably isn't coming immediately. So you have to, the stakes are a little bit higher. And so you're, you're committing, there's a higher level of commitment to whatever ideas you set down, which I think puts an important kind of pressure on you to really think about getting it right. You don't yeah. have unlimited tries, you know, you have, you have this one book and then it's out there and that's kind of your statement about it. And I think that's, that's right. That's something, you know, just in terms of this, you know, returning to this idea of focus and concentration, getting it right, not feeling like you have unlimited tries, which you do kind of on the internet, you know, people will forget, yeah. you can write it again, you know, and then here you go. So the, you know, the, there's pros and cons to both. Uh, right. Yeah, but the but, commitment, the commitment of the book, obliging one to, to forego those future revisions for several months if not years um is also precious it's a it's a culture it's a creative constraint you could say right um obliging you to not to just bash it out and share it and revise it as if everything was always tentative you know time is finite and that you know just as an underlying principle of life there are moments where you have to decide and the book is that forcing function mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. So yeah, all of those reasons. And um, um, I suppose there are probably some more too, but I think it, the, other, the other thing that's going on is wh what else are you going to do, right? So if you're in the business of thinking or believing that the ideas your organization will create and wants to share are of some value, and of course we have our doubts about that sometimes because you wonder is the world just too crazy and is anyone really listening and you know even if they read it and understood it would they know would, would we know what to do and you know one has doubts but insofar as you believe in your purpose that your ideas matter that your ideas may have some cultural impact and some value for those who read them what modality would you use to get them across if not the book because mm -hmm. as you say the website is um, difficult to distinguish from other websites and caught up you know you know with other material on the same site and with um, lots of hyperlinks for the reasons you've mentioned it's not just that though I think um, PDFs which which is how organizations often share things designed PDFs um, don't get read as much. Mm -hmm. They don't have, they don't carry the same esteem. I think it's precisely because you commit to the book being final and you commit to printing a certain number that I think I said in the newsletter that you read, there's something inconvenient about the book that conveys its meaning. You know, the, the, this is a, a distinction I owe to Oliver Berkman, who's got a book coming out quite soon about time. And one of the reflections he has on it is that people can feel the time you've invested in something. Mm -hmm. um, and so a book with all of its references and all of its typeface decisions and the copy editor says this and the typesetter says that and the author wants that bit changed and you say I can't change that because the typesetter has already seen it and it goes on like this for a long time that inconvenience rather than just bash bash bosh up it goes online 
carries with it a lot of meaning because it carries the commitment of those to share it in its final form. Um, and I think it's because the book has that inconvenience that it's so valuable and precious to hold on to it. The, 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 the meaning of the artifact lies in the fact that it wasn't easy to produce. And that somehow it endures that, that there's something that some subtle form is passed from publisher to reader uh, in that process. Yeah, it feels like there's also something there, you know, about the inconvenience that's related to, I don't know, some some notion of of scarcity almost, you know, not necessarily in just a you know, sort of rote economic sense, but like you said, there's only a certain number of these, you know, we could, maybe there will be more, but there will only be more if a certain number of people put their energy into it and want there to be more, you know, you don't just, you know, on the internet, yeah. on the internet, once it's there, it exists forever and it's, you know, uh, kind of fungible, replaceable. Every website is kind of like every other website, and you can just fly through a hundred of them without consequence. And um, so, there's exactly. something there, probably about about the value. I like I like that so, perspective. So one way of one way of thinking of that, Adam, is that it's also a chance for the purchaser of the book to very directly thank the author. I mean, um, you know, online there are you know Patreons, and you know sometimes there's pay per view and so forth, but the default economy is still free content advertising yeah. um pays for it so when there's the book there is you know when you when somebody hears you've written a book they're often quite keen to buy it because they know that even if you only get like you know two percent or something of what they pay um it's still a gift exchange it's still mm -hmm. in that sort of marcel mouse kind of uh most um sense of something anthropological has happened uh, yeah, it's been swapped. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, let's talk a little bit about you know we spent a bit of time talking about the the medium itself, but let's talk about the content a little bit. You've you picked five books as I think I was I was looking around on your website. It looks like you, maybe you had published one full length uh, Already. yeah kind of monograph before, but this kind of feels like a sort of a big push into the whole space yeah. of book book publishing in a new way. So. Yeah. So, so, right. So the history there is that uh, the co-founder of Perspectiva, Thomas Bjorkman, had published in Swedish a book called The World We Create mm -hmm. um, that was in need of translation. And, and the translation wasn't trivial. It was quite a long book. And um, for various reasons, it took a while. But Perspectiva Press was coming online uh, in its earlier forms at that stage. And Thomas was very keen to get the book out there. So this was a perfect match. Mm -hmm. uh that's so that was over a year ago now um maybe even two and um this is this is something different this was like perspectiva as a publisher also trying to attract future authors too because right um you know our, our we hope that the books will financially make sense of themselves we don't have any ambitions to make money and all of the money goes back to the charity to help the venture rather than as any kind of shareholder profit. Um, but even so, it's also part of the overall model of change. Um, so that's why the five came out now. It was something about, yes, a commitment to doing this. I don't know how many we'll do in the future, but this roughly this number a year or a bit less is probably what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. We're not gonna become, you know, HarperCollins or something overnight. Right. Um, right. So in terms of the five, um, they're, one of them is quite different and four are quite similar in their, in their own way. So the biggest of them is called Dispatches from a Time Between Worlds, Crisis and Emergence in Metamodernity. And the shorthand for this book is called The Metamodern Reader, because it's kind of about, here it is here, it's kind of, um, it's an anthology and it includes uh, writing, it's co-edited by me and Liam and Pascal, and although all of the authors would not identify as being metamodernists, and they don't all write about metamodernism as such, there is a sense in which the spirit of whatever metamodernism is, is a sort of underlying question of most of the chapters. But they traverse everything from sort of metaphysics to sociology to a kind of, Jeremy Johnson has a chapter on the planetary, so whatever that is, it's some sort of mixture of ecology and Cosmo vision, or you know, it's hard to quite pin it down. 
Um, Zach Stein has a chapter on education as culture war and how we sort of disarm. Um, Daniel Goritz has a chapter on this on the sort of metamodern sociology as an invitation to scholars of sociology to understand metamodernism better. Um, then we have a we have an we have a chapter on intellectual property, uh, chapter on a metamodern economy, uh, something about political dissonance by Sarah Stein Lubrano. We have a, a chapter between two theologians talking about sort of God and metamodernity. And then Lehman Pascal ends with something about, you know, what a metamodern renaissance would look like. What would that mean? And so it's a broad, it's a broad set of uh, essays. I mean, Salami also has a chapter in there about getting beyond identity politics and what, what it might take to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a wide range, but I feel as the as one of the editors, there is a kind of underlying thread, which is broadly, where are we and what's next in the context writ large? What in the preface I call the perception of context. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was attracted to the way you wrote about uh, your sort of ambiguity about metamodernism as a whole, which yeah. is... Uh, a feeling I share and, you know, I was looking at that volume in particular that you were just describing and just noticing that, you know, we have maybe half a dozen or more authors that have, you know, shuffled between the side view and, you know, been at, you know, the Stoa with Peter Lindbergh and they're in this volume and, you know, they're interested in metamodernism or something close to it, you know, and, you know, I was, attracted to the, you know, the sort of the speculative realism crowd and, you know, maybe 10 years ago in kind of a similar way, just kind of peeking in from the side, just kind of feeling like there's something, something new is trying to happen here. Something new is trying to kind of make itself explicit and known. And at the same time, I, I, I kind of have that, that same feeling that you described of ambiguity. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't know, um, I don't know really what's happening here. I don't know if this is the thing that, you know, I don't know if it's just because I'm a little bit averse to labels and, and, and things like that or, or what, but um, what does that, what, what does that ambiguity look like for you? And why are you still, you know, you're ambiguous, but obviously, you know, editing an anthology like that, I've, I've published an anthology like that um, a number of years ago, and I know how much time and work that is. Yep. Um, yeah. You really have to want to do it. So, what's the what? How does the ambiguity and the commitment there kind of stand for you right now? I mean, well, I'm glad the book's out, certainly, and I, I hope people get something out of it. I know it's a long tome, and they will, not everyone will read every chapter. But um, again, it gives the author something. It builds a certain amount of community, and it, mm -hmm. it it it's also the way we describe it is as being the, the beginning of the end of metamodernism, and um, you know, for that for that sentence to make sense, uh, you need a bit of context as to what we're talking about here. So the book was originally going to be called the Meta Modern Reader, and and in full disclosure, in effect, what happened is at least one, but I think two or three made similar noises uh, of the people we'd planned to have write for it. Say, we're not comfortable with the title. We like the endeavor. I understand what you're trying to do, and the reason for that, and I've, I'm not sharing anything here. I haven't shared with with Hansi directly is that the term metamodernism had been kind of subsumed by Hansi Freinacht, uh, or Freinacht. Um, and um, that's really unfortunate because while I admire what Hansi has tried to do in terms of the, the verve and passion and uh, flair that his books carry uh, and the community that's built up around them, and they're mostly people who are hungry for Mm -hmm. visions of, of what might follow you know however sketchy however problematic people want to know some have some sense of direction you know some sense of what the world might look like that feels credible in a way that mainstream politics doesn't always feel credible and so the Hansi metamodernism kind of became a bit like google is to search engines for a while you know, people would say they would no longer say i'll search for something they say they'll google it so when people heard metamodernism they thought hansi and that, when i say people that's not everyone 
And what's interesting about it as you begin to research it is there is an entirely different subculture that I know you know of through Greg, Greg Denver and he's written for the side view, you know, really quite a big group of scholars writing at quite a high level of sophistication in cultural theory and literary theory and uh, many artists, philosophers, cultural theorists, seeing metamodernism as a sort of new sensibility that was detected in cultural forms, in films and movies and, and pieces of art and books, mm -hmm. um, you know, beginning maybe with someone like, not beginning, but including things like David Foster Wallace novels and, um, for example, Strangers Things or, or the more recent, uh, is it Cobra Kai? Like some of these things that are modern Netflix uh, shows, which seem extraordinarily self-referential with lots of sort of layers of irony and self-reference, but still have this underlying depth and soul that is new, that didn't feel merely like postmodern, ha, look at what we're doing, but still carried some kind of, and yet the meaning of life is here somehow. Um, so, but those worlds are like the oil and water. They just, they're, they're not really, they didn't see each other at all. And Hansi actually said that he kidnapped the term metamodernism to make sense of his own work um, because he thought it was a good phrase to carry his vision of a deliberately developmental society. So that's part of the backstory of these kind of two cultures who don't really talk to each other. In addition to that, uh, Brent Cooper, whom I believe also has written for you, um, he had done some really good work unearthing earlier metamodern sources, including a kind of technology theorist, Borgman, and a liberation theologian, Gonzalez. And they've got a very different view of metamodernism, which is that something like, we need something to save us from hypermodernity. So if you think of Elon Musk as the kind of prince of hypermodernity, or Facebook on stilts, the, the kind of vision of a world that's a kind of tech dystopia, where we all become more and more enslaved by this, this sort of the technological infrastructure around us, such that we cease to be human uh, in some way, that we've lost touch with what it is to be properly human. And for many, metamodernism is a kind of trying to build an antidote or build a countervailing motion that's sufficiently powerful to resist those very strong capitalistic tendencies mm -hmm. taking shape in culture at large. And, and then on top of that, you get people like me and maybe you and Thomas Bjorkman and Lena Rachel Anderson and various other people who come to metamodernism as a kind of umbrella term for this kind of nascent tentative counterculture of people who are instinctively thinking at scale and th instinctively thinking uh, in a certain way that's beyond domains, that's maybe cross-paradigmatic or meta-paradigmatic or however you want to call it. Um, and they find, they find each other online, like you mentioned. We, there's a certain way of thinking and being that whatever has to be built next institutionally and culturally arises from that kind of sensibility. And that's often called metamodern. Now, the ambiguity you speak of is because like you, it's a label, right? It's like, seriously, you're gonna invest your energy and time in this clearly ambiguous and somewhat jaded looking term. I have very mixed feelings about it. Um, I don't think one should place one's hope in a, in a concept really uh, of any quality. Um, but I do think that in terms of metamodernism it, what it does is it's a term to speak to the need to perceive the context at scale clearly. And it does that in two main ways, I think. One is that it, it honors our interiority. It says what's happening inside the psyche is of real cultural and political significance and we need to make better sense of it. And the other thing it does is it says we have to think at scale and um, globally in a planetary sense about where we are at this historical moment. So at the end of my essay, as you know, uh, although it's very much a simplification, I try to map on metamodernism as a sensibility to uh, the old, very basic Ken Wilber um, four quadrant map of reality, which is basically just 
four different kinds of stuff that we have in the world. And I say that the key elements are interiority that I've mentioned, intimacy, and that's a kind of Sam Mickey. I got that from Sam Mickey's book on co-existentialism uh, and the unbearable intimacy of ecological catastrophe. And the intimacy there is something about being on the sinking ship together, the sense of ecological collapse giving rise to a, are you feeling what I'm feeling sensibility of like, we can't go on like this and yet we're stuck in these patterns of inertia. So intimacy, interiority, ecology, I think as a form of perception, uh, and here I'm indebted to William Offels, his great book, Plato's, Re Plato's Revenge, I think it's called, um, just that we have to think ecologically and most people who are metamodern in some sense already do. Um, and I don't mean that just in terms of like environmental interest. I mean that as a sort of pattern of perception. Yeah. And then finally, his historicity. I think one of the postmodern qualities was a kind of, you know, Fukuyama's end of history notion that somehow we'd reached this plateau and now it was just left to entertain ourselves. But that's not where we are. We're at a moment of deep historical reckoning. And so bringing back history into the picture, I feel across the piece that this is what metamodernism does. It serves to bring these, these main currents to bear of intimacy, interiority, uh, ecology, and historicity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that they sort of characterize the metamodern sensibility for me. Mm. You have a lot of threads that I'd, I'd like to pull on there. There, I, I suppose, you know, one advantage of being a publisher is that you can look for things that have an energy to them and an interest and obviously a relevance to the project without necessarily having to throw yourself into the fray, you know? So I very much, I got a lot out of, you know, we did our, our last issue. We had um, Greg Denver, Brent Cooper, Jeremy Johnson, you know, we did a whole little run on metamodernism from, yeah. from sort of different angles. And, um, you know, one way to look at it is like you were saying, you know, there's different groups who are using these terms in different ways. Um, and in different contexts, right? Which is something I'd like to return to in a minute. But mm -hmm. the other thing to look at is just, one of the things that I look at is, okay, what's the actual history? What's the actual genealogy? You know, who who was using these terms early and how was that work being built on? And then, you know, you men mentioned Hansi taking the term and then sort of kidnapping it to make sense of his own, their own project. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all important. But then there's also like the other the other side that I look at, which is just the sociological facts of sort of where the zeitgeist is spinning. And so I, I look at one on the one hand, the, the sort of the chain of succession and the different groups. But then I, I also look and just have to be honest about the fact that, you know, the the Hanzi guys, and I don't, I don't, I'm very interested in what they're doing and I'm not trying to put them down. It's not my style of, of writing. It's too, it's too systematic somehow for me, even though I, I appreciate how much goes into doing something like that. But um, there was obviously some kind of an energy to, to the way they used that term, you know? And so I have to look at that as just a kind of a, a fact of the ecology of ideas. Okay. Why, why was that such an interesting flair like why did that attract you know a whole online community and you know probably in real life too but it, there was an energy to it it became an attractor point and so you just kind of have to look at that and say okay well that's that's an attractor point whatever whatever else we might want to say about it that's real um, and so i think i think that's very interesting and, and worth thinking about as a kind of diagnostic tool where are we what's going on what's happening where is mm -hmm. wh what's where are these attractor points in the ecology of ideas and why is it those attractor points and not these other ones? You know, there's information about the location in itself. Um, but, but what else is interesting, and I think this kind of gets back to your, your books and the, the publishing, is that the, you know, one set of those ideas of metamodernism that was kind of the cultural metamodernism that people like Greg Denver has, have done a great job articulating, and it was actually it was actually speaking with him and reading his work where I kind of got a sense of like, oh, this is what metamodernism is as, you know, yeah. I could, and then I could kind of, you know, in, in a classical faction, fashion, you learn a concept once you can kind of understand what fits under it and you can start picking out details in your environment 
that you know that concept is relevant to i didn't get that until i read his work so that was very that was very helpful but um there's also this fact that the this was a more traditionally academic group of people who um you know they were publishing books and journal articles in academic journals um circulating mostly in universities right and my sense of the the other the the hanzi metamodernism is that it it's more of an online phenomenon more of a i don't know maybe i'm wrong but i don't know of it circulating in universities as much yeah. um but so it's there's kind of two different audiences right and i think this this comes to the question of of genre that i think a lot about and i'd like to hear your thoughts on just in the sense of um you know what what is what genre does perspectiva publish in this is a question i have about myself in the side view it's very it's certainly academic oriented i've given it to people who are out you know are, are outside of academic context and they kind of look at it and go whoa this is this is way too much it's too dense and i kind of go oh no this is i was trying not to be an i was, I was trying it so hard and then you know but the, the reverse is also true that you know i've given it to academics and you know they kind of feel like oh this is more accessible this is so it's it's no, not really no. it's it's not really an academic journal no. it's a journal of some kind but it's not traditional paywall kind of stuff so yeah. well there's a lot tying, going on there I'll, I'll yeah tying back. all my threads together what do you what yeah. do you think about genre and how you're publishing okay so i'll come to this a good segue to mention the other books and explain the genre um, but let me just quickly, well, let me just not forget about the Hansi story, because I want to say something there in a, in a minute. But in terms of genre, um, these four books, um, the other four that Perspectiva published now, um, one of them, just, I'll describe them and then explain what connects them. One of them is called The Entangled Activist by Anthea Lawson. This is sort of a seasoned campaigner, someone who's worked on money laundering and um, she's been arrested for you know campaigning with Extinction Rebellion. Um, she used to work at the Times. She has you know she was a student at Cambridge. So she has some sort of establishment flavor, but also sort of anti-establishment professional life. Um, and it's about being in the field in some ways for many years with other activists, set, you know, who are of the mind that, that campaigning is about sort of getting the bastards. You know, it's about those fossil fuel companies, those big corporates, those governments, bring them down, power to the people. Now, obviously, that's a bit of a caricature, but there's something of that spirit in it. Um, and she was like, well, that's not really working. You know, we, we, we haven't made sufficient progress on major, uh, or, or, or by sufficient, obviously, that's a value judgment, but the, the, by their own standards and their own aims, they haven't achieved as much as they would like most activists. And the question is why? Um, and the book explores that in some depth based on her own experience, including her own relationship with her father, her own, her own experience working, her own encounter with literature. And like, she grapples a lot with Jonathan Haidt and lots of uh, developmental models to try and make sense of what's happening in the activist culture. Um, so that's one book. Um, Indra Adnan writes about the politics of waking up and she's been working in politics one way or the other for many years, initially in the Labour Party, um, but also in sort of various think tanks and she created her own political platform called The Alternative. Um, and she's from Indonesia and she's a psychotherapist and she brings to bear a great deal of understanding of what she calls human givens. It's a model of basic human needs that need to be met by the political system. And they're not just material needs, but also emotional needs for like status, security, belonging, and so forth. Um, and she's, she's thinking about what it would mean to create a new political system that involved, you know, the moment some one or 2% of the population are members of political parties. And so it's about what would it mean for more people to be actually civically engaged? Can we handle that? What kind of trust would it mean placing in people how do you begin to mobilize that energy? Isn't that what we need at scale? She was quite inspired by Greta Thunberg, for example. Um, so again, there's a kind of a lot of personal uh, material in the book. Uh, also a Buddhist, so a lot of, quite a lot of sort of Buddhist influence in the writing. Um, 
and we even have we even have some illustrations in that book because they were originally blog posts that have been edited in the, in the book and the story has a sort of animated quality of trying to build this new political world um, and then two slightly shorter books one by Liam Kavanagh he calls himself a contemplative activist he does quite a lot of work in Plum Village with Thich Nhat Han, um, but he's He's also a, a cognitive scientist PhD at the University of uh, California, San Diego, I believe. Um, and a lot of his work is on what he calls slow intuition. Uh, and so you have this world of Daniel Kahneman and Nudge and uh, behavioral economics, which says, look, uh, intuition is very fast. It's about your quick judgments, your expert judgments, and deliberation is very slow. But he's saying, actually, there's a form of intuition that comes about through contemplative practice. It's about judgment and perception that is lost at the moment. And one of the reasons it's lost is that we're so fixated on ideas. We think ideas are going to save us. And the ideas he looks at in depth are equality, rationality, and individuality. And he's not dissing these ideas. He's not saying they don't have any merit. He's just saying that they're so fundamental to our sense of what's normal and desirable that we can't even see them anymore and, and, under, and understand how they're limiting our perception. And then finally, um, Hanno Burmeister is a sort of political and business consultant in Germany. And the reason I was drawn to this book is it's, it's about transformation, but he takes, he does try quite hard to define transformation, which not many people do. You hear a lot of talk of transformation and not much uh, crystallization of it. And it's based again on his own experience of coming out as a gay man in Germany, particularly with memories of his grandmother, who was a, a Nazi officer. So there's a kind of influence of Nazi culture on the German psyche and his attempt to un, unlearn, the book's called Unlearn, uh, cultural conditioning. Um, and so what, 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 com, what these books have in common is I mentioned earlier systems, souls, and society. They all broadly have some connection between what is the systemic problem? Uh, what is the issue at scale? How do I bring, where am I with that? What is my relationship to that? What kind of memories or experiences or forms of expertise can I bring to bear that may shed light on the nature of the problem? And then how do we find a genre and a medium to articulate it? And the nature of that genre is something like a kind of autoethnography. Um, it's an inquiry into the self through an inquiry into society, an inquiry into society through an inquiry into the self. So it's a sort of mixture of autobiography and memoir with social critique. And in most cases, also a certain amount of um, vision and method too, a certain amount of normative injunction. This is, we should do this um, because I encourage them to do that. I think the world has a lot of critique and some vision, but we need a bit of help in terms of the what should we do now question. Right, right. Where do you so think? There's more, I mean, there's, there's more to say there, but that, you know, I can't answer the genre question more simply, I think, other than to say what unites the books are an attempt to, to sort of break the barrier between personal inquiry and, and social inquiry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where do you think an organization like Perspectiva goes next? I'm thinking specifically of, um, you know, there's, the barrier to, I've said this before, and I'm always curious to know what, what people like yourself think about it. The barrier to entry on the internet is very low, and that's very good um, in a lot of ways. It, it, it multiplies the number of participants available in a conversation who can contribute what they think. And then creating a, a print arm is a little bit higher of a barrier to entry. Um, that takes more thought, a little bit more resources, a little bit more skill. Uh, it also takes more investment from the participants. So there's, there's all these factors there. And then, you know, the, 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 the sort of the legacy institutions that we have also have physical infrastructure. You know, they have places, locations, meetings, events. You know, you've, you mentioned you've been involved in quite a bit of 
of event planning and organizing it previously. Mm -hmm. Where do you think, you know, for these new kind of hybrid organizations that we're all kind of experimenting with, where do you think they go next? Do they need to materialize in the world or is this kind of, is, is the internet the, the kind of the new commons or how do you think about that? Well, it would be lovely if the internet was the new commons, but I think we both know, you know, if you read Soshana Zuboff, for example, on surveillance capitalism, it feels like it's anything but a commons. It's mm -hmm. a, a mostly exploitative, plutocratic place, really. Yeah. Um, but it has commons mm, niches um, as well. Um, where does perspective go next? Well, it's a good question. And... Um, we have to keep on raising funding. We're currently supported by the Fetzer Institute and in one of our projects by the John Templeton Foundation. And we have some support from smaller organizations as well. And increasingly we try and get a little bit of income so we're not over reliant on any, any particular source through, for example, book sales, sometimes through events that we host. We might be building educational material on the basis of the books and on the basis of the essays. Uh, so it's again, training function and maybe the the anti-debate and the improvisation and the metaphor that I mentioned earlier um, may form some basis for a consultancy offer. Mm -hmm. So these are all ways of keeping it going, but that doesn't serve the overall purpose as something different. Where is it? Um, I would love, you know, yeah, just yesterday I went to my old, I used to work at the RSA, which is an established enlightenment organization and it has a beautiful building in the center of London, just behind the Strand. And I was in heaven for a few hours. We just rented a room there for the day to practice the anti-debate. Um, but it was a reminder of how lovely it is to have a place to go. And Perspectiva has had offices in the past, but I'm never quite sure they're worth, you know, quite a lot of money to keep one going. And we even tried to combine it to share spaces with others, but everyone's so particular about what they need that it was hard to make it work. So... I would love to see, the other thing that's going on in this space is in the nonprofit world, especially, but increasingly nonprofit and social enterprise and even for-profit, the boundaries get a little bit blurred at some point. Um, and it, I think the lack of collaboration is not, not so much collaboration. In the commercial world, there's quite a lot of mergers and acquisitions, right? Two organizations, three organizations, they start doing well. They don't keep on competing, right? Sooner or later, the economic logic is why are we, you know, our economies of scale are not great. Shouldn't we combine in some way? Problem in the nonprofit world is everyone has their own little thing, right? So what you're doing for the side view, for example, what I'm doing for Perspectiva, okay, they're very different in some ways, different part of the world, slightly different philosophical emphasis, maybe a different range, number of people, whatever. But there's still a sense in which in, in most contexts we'd be allies, right? Mm -hmm. And there are many more like that. But we don't tend to act beyond conversations like this as if we're one sort of, we don't have class consciousness in a Marxian sense. Right. Um, and I think that's a pity. So one of the things I'd like, it's difficult because it is lovely to have autonomy and control over your own time and work. But if we're serious about impact and changing the world, we do have to get better at working with people uh, who are a bit different from us, who may not always be easy. Um, but then how we do that, how we coordinate that, part of the issue is that it's not a place-based initiative. It is much more global in its mentality. Uh, I say global. I think you'll find in our orbits, we don't hear much about China and Russia and not so much about South America or even Africa, right? It's still quite Anglo-American, uh, American European. Mm -hmm. um, I try and change that a bit in various ways, but it, it's still there. Um, so I suppose where Perspectiva goes... I'm hoping from strength to strength, like I, I'd like to think that that we are sort of beginning to um, stabilize as an organization and consolidate our purpose. And the, the team, I'm very happy with the people that I'm working with, um, very lucky to have great collaborators and that somehow we can um, keep going, but in a way that grows not so much within perspectiva but grows in its influence so that others see that what we're doing is where we have to go i mean to sum that up a lot of people are still working on like problem solving like someone's homeless find them a home 
someone's mm -hmm. hungry, get them some food. A slightly higher level of abstraction, you have people working on policy change, which is like, here's a change in the law that would lead to, you know, maybe universal basic income or something of that sort of scale. And that's also important, it has its place, but it doesn't get to the underlying cultural function of what the society is for, who we are as people, the sort of deep philosophical and cultural roots of things. And for those who believe that's where you get the most fundamental change, um, you need to persuade people that's the case because yeah. not uh, people are not convinced. Uh, and it's hard to prove it. You know, I wonder sometimes if we're kidding ourselves, but I, that's where I place my hope that shifts in perception, shifts in understanding at scale might lead people to go to work the next day and think, actually, what I'm doing doesn't make sense anymore. I have to do something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm definitely in that in that category of people too. And I'm thinking increasingly about, well, I guess, I guess my thought on it is that there are so many different levers of change in society. Some of them are political, some of them are economic, some of them are technological, some of them just have to do with infrastructure. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them have to do with, you know, ideas and culture. And in terms of you know, levers that I might be able to, to reach and pull even in some small way. Um, I've, you know, just increasingly come to realize how important cultural production and cultural reproduction in a material sense, how important that is, how, you know, the great, you know, the great font of, of, of wisdom and, and knowledge and practice that we have available to us doesn't just keep going automatically that, we need to actually remake and sustain those those sources of insight continually and yep. each generation has to do it and we need to somehow you know d conserve and preserve the past and the history and make that available whilst also you know uh, progressing towards new things adapting practices and insights to new and shifting conditions and you know we're certainly dealing with um, a tremendous amount of novelty right now so you know i sign me up for you know, collaborative endeavors, because I, I completely agree with you that um, we can do a lot more together and in a coordinated sense. And then there's that, you know, there's that old philosophical tension between, you know, unity and diversity, or yes. unity and multiplicity, you know, and, you know, I think of, I think of these little organizations, you know, various sizes, the side view is fairly small. Um, and then, you know, you have different, different groups doing similar things at other scales. But I think of them as sort of, like, you know, like old independent record labels, but instead of musical genres, like, you know, punk and hip hop and grunge and whatever, it's, uh, they're almost like, you know, sort of worldviews or uh, perspectives, you know, they're, they're record labels for different kinds of insights, different, you know, they all have a different aesthetic and a slightly different sound to them, you know, so it's not just, it's not just like, uh, propositional differences yep. there's there's a there's yep. a, a conveyance and a, a, a feeling tone and an aesthetic to it that that changes and, and seeing them sort of interact um, is is nice and mm -hmm. i think the strength of having many small organizations is that you break up the homogeneity and you you kind of you you, you keep asking each other questions and that kind of drives a sort of co-evolutionary dynamic uh, but then like you're saying um staying small keeps you limited in scale in a certain sense so there's you know there's a the unity diversity trade-off but then also the the scale the the sort of uh i don't know freedom versus impact scale or something like that i don't know what it is but um yeah you know i think we're we're just coming up on our time here and i haven't even asked you about uh you know any of your key sort of philosophical works of your own so maybe we can um table that and have another conversation uh soon in the future about uh yeah, you know, let's perception talk another time about perception attention concentration yeah awareness and all that stuff um because that would take some time which is probably where you and i are sort of philosophically closest closest aligned yes. um, in yes. addition to this the organizational stuff that we're that we're yeah, both yeah, involved yeah, yeah. in that would be good. I, I i'd like that and um because when you say perception is an art form, I feel as though I've got some intuitive accord with that. You know, it's like, yes, of course, absolutely. And it's um, it's an important art form and one that we need to cultivate 
yeah. with some degree of controlled urgency. Yeah. Um, controlled yeah. urgency is a nice phrase. Yeah. Well, let's, well, let's plan for that. Um, a little bit down the road. Is there is there anything else you want to share with us about upcoming things, other other perspective and news? Um, is there places you want to direct people to in terms of? I mean, I'll obviously I'll provide links to the books and the website and any everything, but um, just other other things you want to close out on to share. Well, I can certainly you know promote things we've done. I suppose. You know, buying the books would be nice, but I mean, that's kind of goes without saying, but people make their judgment about what's of value to them. I think if I were to point people to one piece of writing that sort of sums up Perspectiva, it would be uh, an essay that's actually, it's in the Metamodern Reader that I mentioned, the dispatches from A Time Between Worlds, but it's also freely available online. We released it as a kind of advance introduction to the book, and it's called Tasting the Pickle. Um, 10 Flavors of Metacrisis and the Appetite for a New Civilization. And it's quite a long read, um, but still, I think if you want to get a feeling for what perspective is about and the kind of work we're grappling with, what it means to try and work on different metacrises um, and why, why an organization like us would exist, that's the place to look. Um, and then next conversation with Adam, we can speak about, you know, how being a chess grandmaster informed the view of my work. And there's a book there called The Moves That Matter, A Chess Grandmaster on the Game of Life that will come up next time. But if you are interested, you're welcome to have a look at that as well. Nice, Jonathan. Well, thanks so much for coming along on the show and best of luck with the books and with Perspectiva. And I look forward to our next conversation. Likewise. Thanks a lot, Adam. All right. Take care.